And as we think about this passage tonight, there's so many personal applications of it. What you don't know, I might say, can really hurt you. We don't think that way, but it's true. What you don't know can really hurt you. And I was thinking about uh, a test for next week that we're doing in here, which is, so if you want to study ahead, notable deaths of the last year. And one of the most notable deaths of the last year was the uh, famed football coach at uh, Florida State for so many years. I think he owns the record for all-time wins in college football, Bobby Bowden. Also just a wonderful person, a believer, uh, probably has spoken at more FCA banquets than any man who has ever lived. And he used to, <laughs> he had full of stories and uh, uh, homespun, corn pawn humor. And uh, he used to love to tell the story about a high school football coach whose team was behind and it was late in the game, and uh, all of a sudden they recovered a fumble, and they returned it down to the opposing team's five-yard line, and they're five points behind, so if they score a touchdown, they're going to win the game. And they ran their first play, and they dropped for a one-yard loss to the right side, and ran the second play to the left side, and dropped for another one-yard loss, and then they tried to throw a pass in the end zone, and it was incomplete, and all of a sudden it's fourth down, and the game is on the line, and the coach was so frustrated at the mistakes that his players had made because the touchdown was there on all three plays if they had just executed properly. And so he was so frustrated that he threw his clipboard to the ground and turned around and didn't call a play. And so the quarterback is left in the huddle to call the play himself. And the quarterback calls a play and they go to the line of scrimmage and they score on the last play of the game a touchdown to win the game. And the coach is just thrilled, and he runs out on the field, and he grabs his quarterback, and he hugs him, and he says, how did you know what play to call? How did you decide what to call the play? And the quarterback said, well, coach, I looked in the huddle, and on my left was one of our wide receivers, and he was number 10. And on my right was another one of my wide receivers, and he was number 13. And so I just added those two numbers together, and I called 24 toss. And his coach said, well, son, I don't quite know how to tell you, but 10 plus 13 equals 23, not 24. And the coach said, well, coach, I guess if I was as smart as you, we'd have lost the game. (laughs) Sometimes what you don't know, no, emphasis on the word no, can really hurt you. Much of what 1 John is about is about knowing the Lord. Not hoping, not thinking, not wishing, knowing the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, 40 times in these five short chapters of 1 John 1, the word know is used. In fact, there are only a hundred verses in the five chapters of 1 John 1. And yet the word no is used 40 times. So in other words, every three or four verses, you're getting the word no appearing. I think I see a common theme there of what John is trying to get across to us. And so he says, beginning in verse 3 of our text for tonight, and we can be sure that we know him if we obey his commandments. If someone claims, I know God, but doesn't obey God's commandments, that person is a liar and is not living in the truth. But those who obey God's word truly show how completely they love him. This is how we know we are living in him. Those who say they live in God should live their lives as Jesus did. Dear friends, I am not writing a new commandment for you. It is an old one that you have had from the very beginning. 
Because you remember Jesus said to his own disciples in John chapter 13 in the discourse just before he went to the cross, a new command I give you that you love one another. By this shall all men know you are my disciples if you have love one for another. So John says, I'm not writing a new commandment to you. It's one you've had from the very beginning of the days of Christ. This old commandment to love one another is the same message you heard before, yet it is also new. Jesus lived the truth of this commandment, and you also are living it. For the darkness is disappearing, and the true light is already shining. If anyone claims, I am living in the light, but hates a fellow believer, that person is still living in darkness. Now listen, I'm just telling you now. Though this was written... 2,000 years ago, this is for us right now, today. If anyone claims I am living in the light but hates a fellow believer, that person is still living in darkness because anyone who loves a fellow believer is living in the light and does not cause others to stumble, but anyone who hates a fellow believer is still living and walking in darkness. He says it twice. Then he says, such a person does not know the way to go, having been blinded by the darkness. Now, he's talking about a believer here, or somebody who claims to be a believer. And they're just as blinded by the darkness as somebody who is outside of Christ. Somebody who is not a believer. So, how do we know we love him? How do we know we're a true believer? How do we know that we belong to God? How do you tell the difference between a believer and someone is not? How do you tell the difference between a real Christian and somebody who is not? Because both Christians and non-Christians can look a lot alike. They can. I mean, I could, I could have had all of you go over here to Publix right before church tonight and had you walk through and tell me who were the believers and who were non-believers. Who were Christians and who were non-Christians. Well, it's hard to tell. There's nothing that, I mean, I, the, the night before I was baptized into Christ as a late teenager, It would have been very hard to tell the difference in me that night and the next morning. I mean, I didn't suddenly wake up the next morning with three eyes or an extra appendage or anything. So how do you know a true believer? Except for the smile on my face, Randy the Christian looked about the same as Randy the heathen. So what are the distinguishing features of a Christian? How can you tell the difference? How do you really know the Lord? Well, these verses, John provides us with sort of a Christian self-test kit. These are very important verses. They tell us exactly how we know we're a believer and how we know we may not be, that we may actually be walking in darkness. Important for us to know some things, isn't it? When a woman wants to know if she's pregnant and she's dying to get the news, she almost always purchases a self-test kit. There's a certain hormone that's always present in the urine of a pregnant woman, and the test checks for that hormone. And I remember both times when we were going to have our sons, us being so anxious and couldn't wait to take that test and watch for it. And so I looked up on the internet, and it has some pretty detailed instructions about that particular test. It read, after moistening the test stick, place it on a clean level surface. The wait time is usually one to five minutes. And then it says this in big letters. Try not to stare at the stick for the duration of the waiting period. That's how excited and how anxious you are. Try not to stare at the stick for the duration of the waiting period. Time then will seem to go much slower and you'll become even more anxious. So do something to distract yourself like making a cup of tea or doing some stretches or exercises. Trying not to stare at the stick is probably good advice for a woman who's taking a self-test pregnancy. But 
for a Christian who wants to know if they're a true believer. Am I really a follower of the Lord? 1 John 2, verses 3 through 11 are absolutely a self-test kit that you should stare at on a fairly regular basis so that you can answer the question yourself. Am I a real, true believer or not? We should stare at that test and give it our undivided attention because the stakes are high. You see, this test, this test only indicates the possibility of physical life. The 1 John 2 test is the possibility of eternal without end life. And just like the pregnancy hormone, there are certain characteristics that the old beloved apostle John says here are inherent in a person who claims to be a Christian. And the first one's pretty obvious from the first three or four verses of our text. And that is the commandment, self-test. John writes in verse 3, we can be sure that we know him, we can be sure that we are Christian, if we obey his commandments. So how well do you measure up keeping the commands of Jesus? <laughs> In just a few seconds there, you may feel a little bit like a failure. And if you do, it's because nobody's perfect. Only one person has ever walked on this planet who perfectly kept all the commands of God all the time. And his name was Jesus. Jesus. But when you become a true child of God, a couple of very important things happen. God gives you a new desire. You're not always going to be able to live up to it in every single way. But God gives you a new desire, and that desire is to obey His commandments in your life. What are those commandments? Well... In the Old Testament, there were 613 commandments given under the old law, the moral law and the ceremonial law. 613. And then the, the scribes and the Pharisees and the teachers of the law and the rabbis had expounded upon those and made commandments among commandments until they actually wound up with thousands. And then when Jesus was in his earthly ministry, one of those Pharisees and a lawyer came to try to trap him and question him and said, Master, which is the greatest commandment of all? And so he told us. The greatest commandment of all is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second greatest, he threw in as a bonus, is likened to it to love your neighbor as yourself. And he narrowed all of the commandments down to those two. And then he said, all of the law hangs on these two commandments. What has John been talking about here? Love. Loving God and proving your love for God by the way you love your fellow man. By the way you love your neighbor. He's saying the same thing Jesus said. You see, God doesn't expect you to live out and keep 613 commandments, but he does expect you to keep these two biggies. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Somebody is. Do you have a desire to do that? Do you have a desire to do that? Probably you do, or you wouldn't be here tonight. At least on the love your God. Somebody once counted up and said there are 1,050 New Testament commandments. And 73 of them began with the word be. 73 of them. For instance, the New Testament says be thankful, be kind-hearted one to another, be patient, be of good cheer, be transformed, be baptized, 
Be angry and sin not. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Be of one accord. Be doers of the word. And that's just 10 of the bees. There's 63 other swarming bees around those in the New Testament. Do you have a desire to be those things? Well, that's what loving God is all about and loving your neighbor is all about. Every one of those bees, except for one, had to do with loving your neighbor or loving God. Every one of them. Now, have you kept them perfectly during the last week? Every one of them? No. But don't feel condemned because Romans 8, 1 says there's no condemnation to those who belong to Christ Jesus. If it is your desire to obey the Lord all of the time, you are the kind of person whom God is searching for. Not perfect people, but people who have as their heart's desire to love God with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love their neighbor as their self. But God doesn't just give you a new desire when you become a Christian. He gives you a new devotion. You have a devotion to Him rather than to the world. I mentioned last week that before you came to faith and obedience in Christ, you were running from God and running towards sin. That's what the first two verses of 1 John 2 says. But when you repent, it means that you turn around. I heard someone say recently, I'm going to change my life. I'm going to do a 360-degree turn. And I didn't correct them, but they're confused because 360 degrees is a full turn all the way around. If you're going to change your life and you're going to do a full, it's 180 degrees to change and go in the other direction. But you get the point. Once your life was going in the direction of the world and the flesh and the devil, and they were, frankly, your desire and your devotion, and now Jesus is your new desire, your new Lord, your new master. And when the heavenly master says, do this, you do this, don't do this, you don't do that. After the apostle Paul started following Jesus, he used a certain title to describe himself in his letters, and it's very interesting. He didn't use the title apostle. He didn't use the title head church planner. He didn't use the title head evangelist. He didn't even use the title missionary, though he's well known for all of his missionary journeys and for founding or starting all those churches. He used the term in biblical language, doulos, over over and over again to describe who he was and what he did. The word literally means servant or bond slave. That was his new desire. That was his new devotion was always to glorify God by being his servant. Not apostle, not evangelist, not missionary, not head church planner, servant of Jesus, the word for the lowliest slave. Before coming to Christ, our desire is to sin. But when we belong to Jesus, our greatest desire and our greatest devotion is to glorify Jesus by obeying them. And as you know, many of the early Christians in the early church not only did this and followed Jesus' commands, they followed him even to the point of death. So much persecution, proving their love for the Lord by giving up their very life. One of the most wicked emperors was Domitian. Domitian had found a particular pastor in a particular place that he wanted to get rid of because he was being so effective in sharing the gospel and creating true disciples of Jesus, follow the Lord no matter what the cost. Domitian wanted to get rid of him, so he called in some of his administrators, and he said, I want to have him arrested. And they said, well, that's fine. He said, 
that, but that won't hurt him at all. He doesn't mind jail. And he said, well, then I'll take away all of his possessions. And one of his advisors said, well, that won't do anything to him at all because most of these Christians have already left behind their possessions. And they talk about treasures in heaven. That's all they care about. And Domitian said, then I'll place him in solitary confinement. And he said, that won't hurt him at all. He has this friend that is with him anytime and all the time and everywhere. And that he talks to on a regular basis. He'll just spend more time with him. And Domitian said, well, then I'll kill him. And the advisor said, that's not going to (laughs) work. Because he teaches Christian death is far better than living on this earth. He has a home in heaven that he's looking forward to. And Domitian was ticked off because he was running out of options. And he said, what then can I do to harm this Christian pastor? And the advisor leaned in and said, if you really want to harm him, you really want to do him in, make him sin. Make him sin. That'll do it to him. You see, for a Christian, a true Christian, a true believer, sin hurts us because it violates God's commandments. In 1 John 2, 3, and the verses right after it say, if we truly love God, we'll keep his commandments. If we don't love God, we don't really care about his commandments. So how consistently are we keeping the commandments of God? Do we basically act and talk the same way on Monday through Saturday that we do on Sunday? Do we keep his commandments? The commandment self-test is the first one. Those who say they live in God should live their lives as Jesus did. But the second one, to me, is way harder, way harder in actual everyday life. And that's what I would call in the latter part of our text tonight the compassion self-test. He said, the way that you can know that you're a Christian and that you really love God is if you love God your fellow Christians, your brothers and sisters in Christ. And when we talk about the compassion test, John talks about two kinds of experiences. He talks about walking in the darkness. That's a life filled with hatred. And then he talks about walking in the light as he is in the light. And, and then the fellowship we have with God, we also have with one another. And that's walking with the Lord, as chapter 1 says. The person who walks with Jesus and lives under his influence is a person who walks as he walks and loves as he loves. And there's no stumbling over that because anyone who loves a fellow believer is living in the light and does not cause others to stumble. It's very difficult, some of what I'm about to say. There are going to be people here who leave here tonight mad at me or upset with me on both sides of a spectrum. I'm a son of the South, born and bred in the heart of Dixie, raised in the 60s amidst the incredible racial bigotry and discrimination of segregation. Even the churches were steeped in racism. There were no integrated churches that I knew of anywhere in the South in the 50s and the 60s. Not only church, but as a boy growing up, there was no one in my world who didn't support the notion of equal but separate. Nobody in my whole world. My public school and elementary school was not integrated. My church, nobody else's was integrated. Most of the restaurants I went to were not integrated. Nothing much was integrated. Nobody much that I knew were. 
And I was 12 years old when Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated in Memphis. And I remember the rioting, and I remember the curfews, because I was living in Nashville, also in Tennessee. But I do not really remember being moved much by it. I was 12. Hardly nobody else around me was moved by it, at least as far as I heard of. And during those years, then between 12 and 18, a couple of things happened to me. The first thing that happened to me was the public schools were integrated. And a young man named George Hendricks went to my junior high school, McMurray Junior High School, and we both played football, and I played center, and he played right guard. And at that point, our football coach had put all positions together in the locker room, and so George also lockered right next to me. And he became one of my best friends. And he bled the same color that I did. And he cared the same amount I did about things. And it was my first real experience with somebody of another race. I would have been about 14 or 15. And then in my church, we hired a youth minister, Lytle Thomas, who came in, and he said, we're going to start a bus ministry, and we started busing the inner city of Nashville. And we started busing in, and I was one of the bus captains, and started busing in children who were black of another race. And I'll never forget, I'll never forget as long as I live, I was in high school, and I was a student at Lipscomb, and I had on a suit and a tie, and, and I came in one Sunday morning carrying a young uh, black kid. He was probably about five or six years old, and he had a cold or something. As I got near to his classroom as I'm holding him, he sneezed, and I mean snotted me down that tie just from top to bottom all the way down. And I looked at it, and at first I was appalled. And then I thought, this is a child of God that I am privileged to go pick up on a bus and bring to hear about Jesus. The problem is not him. The problem is me. Over the course of time, I began to realize that what I had learned was simply ignorance, misinformation, even at Lipscomb. As a student at Lipscomb right there, I, I went over into the college and it was there for many years. From, I walked over from the high school into the college and down in the bottom floor of alumni auditorium there on Lipscomb University's campus, a Christian school, there was a bathroom that had been marked colored only. And I, now I'm talking about right now 1971 or 72. I'm not talking about 1941 or 42 or 21 or 22. And they had not even replaced the door. They had just painted over it but you could still read it. In the late 1960s, the largest church of Christ in the world was the Madison Church of Christ in a suburb of Nashville, Tennessee. They had over 4,000 members at Madison Church of Christ, and Ira North was their beloved preacher, and he became one of my mentors, and I was able, toward the end of his life, to be a friend of his and, and get a lot of advice from him, but I didn't know him back then as a kid, of course. But when the first black family came to try to place membership at the Madison Church of Christ, there were some people who were in opposition. And I will never forget, our North got up on a Sunday morning in front of thousands of people, and he said, we send missionaries to Africa. 
I simply will never abide with any doctrine that says to heaven with them in Africa and to hell with them at Madison. That says to heaven with them in Africa and to hell with them in Nashville. Well, as a boy growing up, I had never heard that, but that made not only eminent logic to me, it made scriptural sense because of the passage that we're reading tonight. I, I would much prefer that you think I was always loving and accepting of all people, but that's not true. I was blind. The last verse of our text tonight says, blinded to the heart of God and the truth. And that kind of blindness is very real. And it can blanket whole segments of society. And I believe that when Jesus filled my heart with his light, it drove out the darkness of hatred and prejudice. His light shined so brightly, there's no longer any room for hatred. And these are not my words, these are John's words the one who was the closest to the Lord. This is what he says. And so, anyone who hates a fellow believer is living and walking in darkness. Such a person does not know the way to go having been blinded by the darkness. And so I began working. When I left my home church, I went out and was a youth minister in Rivergate out in the Madison area, actually, and we began busing the inner city. And Diane was one of the bus captains on one of our buses as we bused the inner city as well. And so we started what we call the B program, bus ministry, and, and then we merged eventually into what now has become known as inner city ministry, bringing hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. Probably they've baptized more people than anybody in churches of Christ in the United States. By far, it's not even close. Not even close. I'm glad I've been given another chance to see the blindness of hatred. And so I made it a point not only in helping start inner city ministry, but in every single church I've been in, I made it a point to make sure it was integrated. I would not serve in any church that was not. A couple of years ago, like everybody I know, I was horrified to see the video of George Floyd's arrest and then eventual murder. It angered me. Why does this kind of injustice have to happen again and again and again and again? Racism is an evil we work hard to try to eradicate from our society, yet it hangs on. And yet, to be honest, at the same time, I sometimes wonder what is left for us to do. Equality is now the law of the land. It wasn't. For a long time. Institutions are now integrated. They are. A black man was elected president of the United States twice in elections that were not even really close in a country where only 12% of the people are black. There is a black female vice president right now. Southwest Florida Collier County and Lee County is less than 10% black, and we are represented by Congressman Byron Donalds, who is black. Atlanta has had a black mayor continuously for a half a century. Minneapolis, where George Floyd was tortured by police and killed, had a black police chief at the time, and their department had had mandatory racial bias training since 2015. Our society fires and shames people who use racist language. We punish racist motives. 48 states now have hate crimes, hate crime laws that were based on racism. I, 
I do sometimes on the other end of the spectrum wonder what more. I think tearing up our cities and hurting innocent people and property is counterproductive. But whatever is left to do peacefully, let's do it. I'm just asking what's left. I'm not a sociologist. I'm, I'm not a psychiatrist. I am just a preacher. But it seems to me the problem is not as much a skin problem as it is a sin problem. And unless we ever focus on it as a sin problem, that it is wrong to hate your neighbor, period. That's what Jesus said. That's what John verified a hundred years later. Until we focus on that, until we focus on changing the heart, I don't think there's much else we can do that would put an end to racism. Blindness is the problem, our text says. People who hate are living and walking in darkness, and they have been blinded by the darkness, which is always a representation of the devil and evil. When our Lord opened blind eyes, People's hearts changed. Some of us brag about how we're colorblind. We don't see color. We're not black or white. We're just people. We're all children of God. That's not entirely true. At least it's not entirely true for black folks. The reality of the situation is in American cultures that black people do get racially profiled. After the George Floyd incident, I sat here on this stage because COVID was going on at the same time. I sat here on this stage with Fred Atkins and Ron Battle, two of our elders who happened to be African American, and we filmed a segment. How many of you watched it or have seen it since then? Well, there are nearly 6,000 people that have watched it. We don't have 6,000 members. Around the country, there are nearly 6,000 people who have watched it. And I asked them questions, and they both gave me examples. They're two of the finest men I've ever known, two of my best friends that I've ever known, two men that I helped pick as elders in this church 25 and 30 years ago. And they started telling me times about how they or their families have been racially profiled. We can't act like that's not different from us. Society makes assumptions all the time based on skin color. Sometimes individuals do too, and it can be hurtful and unfair. And it's not just, I might say, about white people profiling black people. Black folks can also have preconceived notions about white people. None of us are totally color blind. A loving church is not going to say we are neither white nor black. It says we are both white and black. We don't need to be color blind as much as we need to be color brave. Standing for love and against hate. Period. I hear so much talk today about racial reconciliation as if we will somehow learn how to get along by attending a rally and holding hands and everybody singing we shall overcome or kumbaya. That's not going to happen. That's nothing more than symbolic gestures or politically correct statements. The only way we learn to love one another, regardless of our backgrounds and our differences, is to let the author of love open our eyes from blindness and open our hearts. That's the only way. How, my friends, how do you know you are a Christian? Wow. This text says very clearly and very plainly. Do you want to keep the commandments of God? 
Do you love other people, not hate them or judge them? For any reason, I picked on color of skin tonight, but I could have picked on other factors as well. Do you love others? And you know what? I'm, I'm proud mostly of this church. I think this church is, has been, for the most part, efforting for years to love God and to love people and to not hate people, regardless of why. But we can always do better, and we can always keep staring at the stick. Staring at the stick. The stick with the self-kit test of commandments and compassion for everybody. 